chose to see glory and to live down here with men. Oh, what love. Oh, what love. Oh, what love. Thank you. Let's try it again. Oh, what love. Oh, what love. To save a sinner just like me Oh, what love Oh, what love That you would come to die for me On Calvary You could have turned your face away president and let him know publicly, I love you. And I'm just grateful for everyone that's out today. Thank my wife, almost 30 years, for, for still loving me <laughs> after all that we have gone through. And God has been so kind. And then to have such a heavy topic. But God is good, amen? amen? My title today is Just For Me. Just For Me. So we're going to start with prayer and we're just going to go to work. Is that all right? Amen. Loving Father, gracious and merciful God, this is your church. We are your people. We want to be more like you. So Father, we just ask you in these moments of time, take Kronos and make it Kairos. Take ordinary time, God, and make it sacred time. And may the moments we spend together change each and every one of us, Lord, in this place and throughout the airwaves and wherever this message may find itself. And then one day, God, when we do get home, may we be able to celebrate what you've done, Camp Meeting 2014. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the church say amen, amen, amen and amen. Matthew chapter 5, beginning at verse 1, the Bible tells us, Seeing the crowds, Jesus, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. 
Verse 2, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Stay thirsty, my friends, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons and daughters of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falseless, falsely on my account, says Jesus. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And my, my, my text today is uh, verse 7, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. I must confess that when I looked at the text, I, I, I was convicted. The more I studied, the deeper I had to understand that my heart is not where I want it to be. I, I believe I'm a merciful person. I believe I'm a kind person. But when I look at the Word of God and the Spirit of God started to just move on my heart, I realized I, I'm not as merciful as I want to be. And I, I hope and pray we can be a little more merciful. Is that all right? You see, there's a powerful significance extracted from the lessons which Jesus shares in this instructional monologue. Yet to, to, to truly appreciate its instruction, one must travel back to a few towns and villages to experience the living, transformative ministry engaged in by Jesus. The capital W word gives us an illustrative Example of what could be accomplished when genuine selfless service is rendered with an unbridled connection to the source of all power. He is the same one who said, greater works than these shall thou do also, because I go unto the Father, isn't he? Jesus shows us what can be done when self dies and humanity finally decides to cooperate with divinity. You see, there's something about the, when the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, a unity of uh, three co-eternal persons come together uh, on one, and they're always on one accord. But when they come together in harmonious fellowship for the elevation, for the redemption, and for the transformative restoration of women, men, and children, awesome things happen. The gospel of Jesus Christ is not only in word, but it's in power. The Bible lets us know in the fourth chapter of Matthew, beginning with verse 23, something happened before the Beatitudes began. The Bible says, And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching, teaching in their synagogues, preaching, the gospel, the good news of the kingdom, of the kingdom, not the church, of the kingdom, uh, just a teaching moment. Jesus mentions the church twice. He mentions the kingdom almost 150 times in the New Testament. Just, just something to think about. But Jesus teaching and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of dis ease among the people. Fame went out through all the Syria and, 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 and they brought then to him all the sick people who were afflicted with various diseases and torments and those who were demon possessed, epileptics and paralytics. And he healed them. I wonder what the church of the living God would do today if word got out that this was a place of healing and restoration. I wonder what would happen today if the word got out, if, if you could just get down to the Seventh-day Adventist church. 
uh, that you can just have somebody to carry you or uh, push you or uh, drag you down to the church. That something powerful is going to happen at the church. I, I heard the Lord is there at that church and because they're living out his word and they're leaning and depending on him no matter what your malady, God is going to do something for you. What would it be like if all of a sudden our churches were overrun with sick folk and broken folk and needy folk and individuals that knew if I could just get to the church, everything would be all right. I wonder what that would be like today. I wonder. I wonder. And then Jesus. Don't you love Jesus? Matthew, being a Jew, is pointing everything toward the fact that Jesus is Messiah. Every parable, every story, he's bringing parallels from the Old Testament to the New Testament. And even here, with the sermon on the what everybody? Mount. There are reflections of what occurred with Moses on Mount Sinai. He tries to make it clear in the Jewish mind that even if you take time and look at the Beatitudes, the first four Beatitudes are discussing our relationship to God. That's why the first four are truly spiritual because God wants to prepare our hearts before he gets to this, this one we're talking about. Because it's unnatural for human beings to be loving and kind and compassionate. It's unnatural for human beings to go outside of their comfort zones and to pick up somebody else's burden. It's unnatural for human beings to love the unlovable, touch the untouchable, and actually have the audacity to lift up those who tear them down. It's unnatural for human beings. Unnatural. When we show love and compassion, it's only because there's something God is doing in our lives. And Jesus, I love this, and seeing the multitudes. You see, Jesus had a backdrop to this passage. I'm so glad that we see Jesus. As Jesus, I believe in my sanctified imagination, takes us time and gets set. He recognizes that this message would be heard throughout the generations. He realizes that, as some of others have said, he realizes that, that the disciples really don't know what they're in for. He recognizes that, that, that they have to understand that this is not just a kingdom that is based upon position and authority. Because there's a difference between having power and a position and or authority. You see, Jesus wanted to make it clear to them. And as Jesus starts to talk, as he looks out at the multitudes, I can hear this voice, this melodic voice, this voice bathed in the spirit of heaven, this voice refined in the courts of glory. This voice tuned uh, with the tuning fork of eternity. This voice def defined and confined within the human being, the fleshly nature. This voice resonates as he starts to speak to his disciples. And as he speaks to them, I can almost see the quizzical expressions on their faces as they wonder, what's this? Have you ever signed up for something? And when they start to tell you what you've gotten, all you can say is, 
what's this? <laughs> the disciples weren't sure what was going on. And, 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 and I believe that just for a moment, Jesus forgot himself. Uh, when Arthur does say, he starts to speak the language of heaven. Blessing. I believe that just for a moment, because he was there and so many people had been healed and so many people had been restored and so many households had been reunited and so many minds had been transformed and so many blessings had been extended and for just for a moment, when he could walk through a place and there was no one sick and no one sorry, walk through a place and there was no death, no disease, no divorce, no discord, just for a little while. There were no demons, just for a little while. There was no pain, just for a little while. There was no suffering, just for a little while. There was no sorrow, and just for a moment, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus looks on those people, looks up to glory and forgets himself and starts to say, bless it, bless it. Bless it, bless it. And he starts to celebrate for a moment the blessings that God had bestowed upon humanity. But I also believe he was looking towards that day when all of God's blood washed children would stand around the sea of glass as they prepare in that perfect square to walk into the gates into the city. I believe with all my heart he was preparing his disciples not only for a temporal ministry but he was preparing them for eternity but they didn't know it yet they didn't know it yet you see this blessedness my kiros my kairos it's happy but it's not a subjective happy it's not an external happy. Uh, it really, really, that, that blessing really rests solidly in the Hebrew shalom. Uh, that meaning of peace. You see, God's peace is never without turmoil. Not in this world. God's peace is never without pain. Not in this world. But the issue is not what's going on outside of you. Elder Kelly, but what's going on inside of you? You see, I've learned over my few years of living that, that what's outside of you really doesn't mean a whole lot. We get all excited about what's outside of us. We get all excited about our titles and our status. We get all excited about stuff that could change in a heartbeat. We get excited about new cars and new clothes. We get excited about money in the bank. We get excited about promotions on our jobs. We get excited about material things. But, but could I just share something with you today? You may be up today, but you can be down tomorrow. You may be CEO today and homeless tomorrow. You may have everything this world affords today, and be broke tomorrow. You may be applauded today and cursed tomorrow. Nothing in this earth outside of you is permanent. No, you don't want to hear that. The only thing that will last is Christ in you, Christ in me the hope of glory. Nothing else lasts. I wondered when I was young, and my mother would say, son, material wealth isn't all that. I said, what do you mean, Ma? She says, not all that. I said, what do you mean? She said, well, you'll see. When we were going through our hard times, and you were four, and my father, your father and I had to separate because of his challenges and, 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 and because 
I wanted to spend time with you. I started cleaning wealthy Caucasian people's homes and how that, and she started naming names. And see, I remember this one. And this man back in the, 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 the late, the, the early 60s was worth well over $700 million. And this man had all the trappings because he was wealthy, but he couldn't eat. He had ulcers, ulcerated stomach because, and she asked him, he, he would say sometime, he say, he said, Ina, I wish I was like you. And she said, what do you mean like me? She said, because you have peace. He said, well, why don't you have peace? He said, because every day I wake up, I'm afraid that I'm going to be broke. But then she told me something else after several stories similar to that. One other one I want to share with you because one of the things I want us to be crystal clear about when we start talking about this issue of mercy is that we've got to wake up to where our real priorities are and our core values in the Seventh Day Adventist Church. Because some of us are so caught up with our middle income lives, which are not really middle income lives. Because if truth be told, most of us are two paychecks from homelessness. But, but we have a, a, an image that we are so prosperous and so blessed that we can look down on folk. And what we wind up doing sometimes is we set our children up for failure because we go and max out our cards take two and three jobs to look like we're prosperous and we're struggling worse than anybody else around us. And then we beat our chest because we're Seventh-day Adventists. I didn't say Christian. But this other young lady whose parents were very wealthy, both mother and father were lawyers. And this young girl, I'll never forget her as long as I live. Her name was Janie. Janie was a sweet young girl. Sweet young girl. I remember seeing her later on in life. I saw her two times. One time we were, we were traveling somewhere in New York City and, and I saw her and she kind of said hi and, and we talked for a few minutes and she went. But the second time I saw her, it was in a, it, it, leaving a bus station uh, up in my hometown in Spring Valley, New York. And, she was leaving the bus station and she, she smiled and she hugged my mom and she, she hugged me and she just laughed. A few weeks later, we hear that this child from a wealthy family that was given everything that could possibly be given to her, she had overdosed from heroin because she was empty inside. I'm trying to let you know something, saints. When we're talking about being Seventh-day Adventist Christians, our our core values must match up with God's core values. Who we are is not dependent upon what we have. There's no hierarchy in God's kingdom. I'm so glad. You can be all that you want to be if you just let God be first. I'm not going to keep you long today. So everything changes. And what you've got to understand, what I've got to understand, that unless we hold on to Jesus, unless we're sold out to Jesus, we'll never make it. You see, the Beatitudes are about ethical living. Ethical living. The Beatitudes are ethical instructions for Christians awaiting the second coming. The Beatitudes are about sanctification and a transformation that can only take place with the infilling of the spirit of the living God. The Beatitudes have been commentated on by church fathers. They've been preached on by endless religious people. They've been delineated by Hindus and 
Buddhists and Muslims, but you can't do this thing without Jesus. Only God can take a hard, cold heart and melt that thing. So when we talk about the Beatitudes, we talk about living ethically. Now just, to, just quickly, ethical, what, what does it mean to be ethical? Pertaining to or dealing with morals or the principles of morality. Pertaining to right and wrong in conduct. Doing the right thing for the right reason. Oh, 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 oh no, 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 you don't hear me today. Doing the right thing for the right reason. Many of us are good at doing the right thing, but we don't do it for the right reason. I can't judge your motives, but God can judge your motives. When you do the right thing with the wrong motives, you may have well have done wrong. <laughs> Y'all don't want to get it. It's all right. It's all right. You've got to do right because you are right and it comes out of a right life. What you do has to come out of what you are. If you're a liar, you're going to lie. If you're a thief, you're going to steal. If you're a whoremonger, you're going to whoremong. Uh. But you're going to do and be what you are. And I'm not mad at non-Christians because they're just being who they are. They're not trying to fake it to make it. They're letting you know, this is me. This is my thing. This is who I am. They're honest with you. I cheat because I'm a cheater. I lie because I'm a liar. I will rip you off and rob you because that's what I do. I'm not mad at them because they're telling you, this is me. And we have to understand when it comes to living our lives, We've got to make sure that we are actually allowing our lifestyle to be consistent with our practice. Let me say something else, and I'm going to get out of here in the next few minutes. You can believe that. That's why we're having such problems with our children. Because these are some of the smartest kids on the planet. These children can think from cause to effect. These children can go down and Google almost anything they don't understand. So they're looking at us in the church and they're saying they're hypocritical. They're looking at us in the church and they're saying they don't love Jesus. And some of our homes, I shouldn't go there, should I? Dr. Rubin. But some of our homes are not Christian places. Uh, let me just pause just for another second before I just run on to my... Sometimes we come to the point where we think that God is going to save us just because we have a name on the front door. And yet there are folk that treat their wives and their children like dirt. There are people that beat their wives. There are individuals that have the nerve to name the name of Jesus and their wife couldn't buy a, couldn't buy a pair of stockings if her life depended on it. We have to understand today that if this church is gonna be attractive, then we've gotta learn how to be merciful. If this church is gonna be attractive, we're gonna to have to learn how to be forgiving. If this church is gonna be attractive, we have got to get to the point where we as men and women of God can tell our wives and tell our children, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I hurt you. I'm sorry I neglected you. I'm sorry I don't show the love for you I show for other people. I'm sorry that my work takes precedent over your family life. I'm sorry.
See, some of that I'm sorry can get you a long way. Skip some of this, skip some of this. You see, sometimes being more like bratty little children. You know that three-year-old child in the daycare? And they take all the little toys out the box and put them behind the back. And then they take one toy. That's not to play with, that's the weapon. And when all the other little children come, say, no, 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 just for me, just for me, just for me. Sometimes we have to confess when it comes to this message, it's just for me. You see, Mount, Mount of Blessings 21.3, Many of us con must confess we're more inclined to identify with the bratty three-year-old than with Jesus. Thoughts from Mount of Blessing, the heart of man is by nature cold and dark and unloving. The natural response of immature children, unconverted saints, or well-indoctrinated Pharisees is to be cold and callous to those who they see or perceive as being undeserving. Do we have a caste system in our church? Come on, Doc. Every, every evangelist will tell you there's something wrong. I bring in folk from all classes and they're going to say, well, they don't know how to act like us. They're not Adventists. You didn't indoctrinate them well. Yeah, we told them about Jesus. Gave them the 27 fundamental belief. You didn't indoctrinate them well. Oh! What you're saying really is, they haven't learned to fake it like you do. I've come to a point in ministry where I'd rather see folk be who they really are. Then I know how much work I need to do. Than for them to be sitting around struggling, talking about God is good. And then marriage is falling apart. God is good, and they can't wait to go see their girlfriend or their boyfriend. God is good, and they have an alcohol problem that they couldn't tell anybody about because we, we, we would have put them out a long time ago. God is good. You see, the essence of mercy and being merciful is the fact that you recognize one time that was you. You weren't always eating veggie burgers and dressing up in suits and ties and trying to, trying to at least pretend you were holy. There were times in your life, I don't care if you even grew up in the church, there were times in your life you weren't saved, you weren't sanctified, and you, weren't clue, you had no clue on the, who the Holy Ghost was. But now, since God has taken away the external trappings. You walk around like you're better than everybody else. I don't want those folk in my church. I'm tired of being overrun by those people. And some of us got those people in our families. Well, we want to reach a certain class. Before I run to the end of this, let me tell you something. When it comes to being wounded and broken and suffering and having sorrow and grief and pain, it goes all the way from the super rich down to the super poor. And if you don't recognize where God brought you from, then you'll never identify with wounded people. Because one other thing I want to tell you before I run on, we usually are meanest and angriest and most unforgiving with people who have the same sins that we may not be outwardly practicing, but we're inwardly holding on to. 
And even if we're not doing it, we wish we could. Talking about merciful, merciful, merciful. You see, it's interesting that anytime anyone manifests a spirit of mercy and forgiveness, he or she does it not of itself, but through the influence of the spirit, the divine spirit moving upon the heart. We love him because he first loved us, 1 John 4, 19. God himself is a source of all mercy. His name is merciful and gracious. And isn't it peculiar that God doesn't treat us as we deserve? Isn't it peculiar that God doesn't look for ways to disqualify us from salvation, but he loves us so much that he gives us what we need so we can be qualified through him? Because you can't do it on your own. I like what Ellen White says here. She says, I'm so glad. She said, he's not vindictive. I'm going to leave that alone. Yeah, I'm going to get you. I'm going to get you. It may take six months. Two or three years. But I'm going to get you. Matter of fact, if it doesn't look like you're going to slip, I'm going to throw a banana peel out there. So I can get you. Sometimes we're vindictive. I'm not gonna even work with it hard. We, we just wait to hurt somebody. And when we hurt them, we're such good Pharisees. So our conscience doesn't bother us. We justify what they did for our behavior. You know they deserved it anyway. I was just holding up the standard. Ellen White says, he seeks not to punish, but to redeem. Blessed are the, who are the merciful. The merciful are partakers of the divine nature. And in them, the compassionate love of God, the compassionate love of God finds expression. All whose hearts are in sympathy with the heart of infinite love will seek to reclaim and not to condemn. Young girl gets pregnant. Some folks still doing it today. I don't. This fellowship or not, this fellowship or get rid of her. I say, how kind of, what kind of foolish is that in the 21st century? Foolish is that in the 21st century? Half the time, the girl didn't want to be there anyway because there was nothing there for her anyhow. So you're going to throw her out now. So she can say, yeah, they're, they're hard, cold anyway. See, what I do is I say, no, something has to be done. So first of all, and I'm not perfect by any means, but first of all, I sit down with the young lady and see if her heart is soft or not. And if she is sorry, and I'm not God, but I say, all right, honey, how many months do you have left? Well, we're going to sit down and talk together and pray together. We're going to study a little bit, and I'll call you every now and then, and you call me when you're struggling. And when you have that baby, what we're going to do is we're going to bless that child. Because there's nowhere in the Bible, y'all, there's nowhere in the Bible that says you got to bless a child that doesn't have both mother and father in the back room somewhere. When you find it, tell me. I haven't found it yet. All I see was Jesus blessed the children. And that stigma for children that have no parents. We never let it live down. Ten years later, wasn't that sister so-and-so? She had a baby. But Jesus was supposed to have been a bastard child. That, 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 that's what the spiritual conversation was. They said, he ain't worthy. They, 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 that's an illegitimate kid. Joseph don't know who his daddy is. They say it's God. <laughs> but you know that young girl got with somebody he carried that stigma with him all his life that's why when he came home 
And he started saying, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good tidings unto me. He is to bind up the brokenhearted, to set at liberty the captives in the opening of the prison to them that are bound to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And that's where he stopped. That's why they said, hold, who's he? Nerve of some folk. He gonna come up in here preaching and teaching. Little bastard child. And right now, it looks like we really, really have a lot of things just for us. Coming from the book by Sean Copeland and Fleshing Freedom, Body, Race, and Being, page 81 and 82, Sean says, during the, his ministry, Jesus was drawn to the diseased, drawn to the diseased, the lowly and excluded persons of society. He affirmed marginalized bodies and was willing to touch persons on the fringes of society, including lepers, the blind, the deaf, the lame, and many individuals with troubled mental states. His life, ministry, death, and resurrection demonstrated God's willingness to be in relationship with all types of people, including broken and diseased bodies. But for many of us, this is our gospel, this is our church. They're not coming in my church. This is my health message. This is my women's ministry. This is my men's ministry. These are my prophecies. These are our books and our magazines and our journals. This is our stuff, education message, which I don't believe many of us really understand the holistic nature of the education message of the Seventh-day Adventists. When you go back with Spalding and Mayan and you work it on through, I don't think we fully understand it right now either, but thank God for what we do have, amen. amen. But it's all ours. Quick example, and I'm gonna run to the close. God in Alabama had to touch the heart of corporate America to provide scholarships for private schools. Schools were dying. As many of our schools around the country have died. And when a few dollars came in, very few people celebrated. They didn't say this is just a period we're going through, transition with learning and trying to figure out what's going on. No, I don't want those type of kids with my children. I don't want those type of children in and out of my school. Look for help. Folk just keep throwing dirt. But don't you know God knew we weren't going to reach out to anybody? So he tried to send us somebody so we'd have something to work with. We serve a God that is caring and compassionate and merciful. We serve a God who is willing to reach down to the depths so that we can be able to be used by him. Mercy love and compassion it doesn't say you're not guilty but it say i'm gonna look for the best in you regardless of your life it doesn't say you don't deserve it it says i'm gonna give it to you anyhow because what god did in my life he can do it for you so i close with this skip all of this stuff i close with this i close with this from the edge 
This is Jonathan Chisholm. From the era of slavery to the present, some examples of ministerial outreach and support systems in black churches include assistance to runaway slaves, services for emancipated slaves, ministry to children in the foster care system, to youth in gangs, to persons infected with HIV and AIDS, to persons with physical and mental disabilities, to persons in recovery and drug treatment programs, to ex-offenders or returning citizens as they call them now. And in some churches, the persons who have been alienated because of their sexual orientation and preferences. Isn't it a shame we had to get a statement on how to be nice to people that are different than us? But here's a promise and I'm gonna finish it up. He who has given his or her life, amount of blessings 24-1, he who has given his or her life to God in ministry to his children is linked with him who has all the resources of the universe at his command. His or her life is bound up by the golden chain of the immutable promises with the life of God. The Lord will not fail him or her in the hour of suffering and need. Philippians 4.19 said, My God, my God, my God shall supply all thy need according to his riches and glory through Christ Jesus. I want to close with this. I want to close with this. Nicole Norderman, she revised Charlotte Elliott's 1835 hymn, Just As I Am, talking about Christ's willingness to accept persons in various states of brokenness. If it blesses your soul, just say amen. Just as I am, I wondered how to come to him. I dare not believe it true that you regard the orphaned ones, beloved daughters, worthy sons. The broken and the barren too, I heard I could find some rest in you. What kind of love in injury's place would leave instead the stain of grace? So I come in sorrow and I come in shame. I come to the cross with my pain. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me and that thou bids me come to thee. Oh, Lamb of God, I come. The pardon that I found from sin spilled from where the nails went in. I had not lived until that day, and I know there is a crown for me beyond where mortal eyes can see. And I don't nod to any man, but offer me just as I am. So I come rejoicing with the hands held high, and I come singing words of new life just as I am without one plea but that thy blood was shed for me and that thou beatest me come to thee O Lamb of God O Lamb of God O Lamb of God I come I come I come blessed 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 are the merciful blessed are the merciful for they shall, they will, they will have mercy.
want to invite you, those that want God to touch our hearts and help us be more merciful. If you want to just come to the front right now, we just want to have a last word of prayer. We're not going to belabor this, but I don't know about you, but I was convicted. I'm not as merciful as I want to be. And I want God to touch my heart so I can be so, so transparent, so caring, so compassionate. That if they turn Jesus away, it's not because of me. Anybody else want to join me? I'm not just saying it's you. I'm saying I need help. is just like you are. I'm not going to leave you that way, but I'll take you that way. In our homes, on our jobs, with our family and our friends, our loved ones, our neighbors. Just want to be more like Jesus. I want the mercy I've given to others to be given back to me one day. Pastor Seals, if you come forward and pray for us today. Touch somebody's hand, even if you're out in the audience. This is a family, y'all. If it's not a family, we need to shut the doors and close them and keep going. God's people are the family of God. Touch somebody's hand. Draw near to someone that's close to you. We're a family. And in every family, there are arguments. And in every family, there are challenges. But at the end of the day, you're still family. Hallelujah. Father, now in the name of Jesus, Lord, we ask for your forgiveness. Because, Lord, without your forgiveness, we are hard-pressed to forgive someone else. Not my mother, not my sister, not my brother, but Lord, it's me that stands in the need of prayer right now. Father God, I need your anointing like never before. Lord God, clean my heart from the inside out. Remove all the stuff, oh Lord, that I've placed in there for security measures because I don't want to be hurt anymore. I've put in so much stuff, Lord, for security that I can't even feel. Lord God, I'm asking now that you have mercy upon your people. I'm interceding, O oh Lord, for those who stand in their own brokenness, O oh Lord, knowing that they need help from above. Lord God, I'm standing in the gap for those who have no words to say because they can't even begin to articulate how they feel right now. Lord, there's someone here today, only thing they can do is just simply say, Lord, help me. But Lord, for that person who feels like they have it all together, I am praying on their behalf as well, oh Lord, because it is that same attitude of having everything together that will lead them right to hell. Lord God, what we really need is you. Come behind the enemy lines. Invade our hearts. Change our characters. And make us fit to be citizens of your kingdom. Lord God, even if you have to do like you did in Sodom and Gomorrah and go into the city and drag some of us out, do that. And give us, Lord, the strength not to look back. Someone today, Lord, is wondering how can they get out? But if they got in, there's a way out. Someone, Lord, is just barely trying to hold on. I'm comforted, O oh Lord, by the words 
pen of inspiration just simply says that when we're at our lowest moment, Jesus himself comes down and holds us in one arm while he lifts the other hand and grabs on to the throne of grace. Lord, somebody's there right now that needs you to grab them. Father God, I'm praying for our families today. The enemy is angry, but I'd rather have him angry than happy with us. Lord God, I'm praying for broken hearts. I'm praying, Lord, for broken families. I'm praying for broken individuals. And Lord, we need Jesus. Allow your spirit, Lord, to just come into this place and have your way with each and every one of us. Forgive us of our sins. And let, help us to know, Lord, that you do love us. And help us to love ourselves and help us to love others. And we thank you in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' precious name, every blood-bought soul shouted amen.